Welcome Nina Angelo to the One Space Love Show for the second time. How are you? It is. Yeah. Hi Steph. How are you going? I'm good. Yeah, it's beautiful to have you in Sydney visiting me and what a circle we've experienced together. And today I got to pick you up um, from St. Catherine's in Waverley, which I hadn't been to that school since I left in 1991. Wow. And you were there because you're also an old girl at the school I and am. what was today tell me today was a um it, it was at the alumni luncheon for students who were there 50 years and over ago wow. so i went to st catherine's when i was five in 1952 mm. and i left in 1963 so um it's, it's hard to get your head around, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Well, I was nine when they had their centenary. It's the oldest independent girls' school in Australia. So I remember dancing is around it? the Maypole. And I actually saw yes, some photos seen, there yes. today. Mm. And uh, and they said, you know, the young girls were dancing around the Maypole. And I was one of them. I was looking for myself in yes. there. Yes. Because when mm. I went to collect you, actually the lady that looked after you was one of the mothers of one of the students. So it was just it was such a beautiful moment. And yeah. You know, it really took me down memory lane of just actually having to calibrate to, you know, we're going to discuss now today trauma. And yeah. not that I had trauma at St. Catherine's, but just all the experiences flash past me because I haven't walked in those doors since I left, actually, because I was living overseas and then Melbourne and then, you know, so it's the first time. And I walked past the same classrooms that I did art, which is where I found my love for fashion and creativity wow. because I had some incredible teachers that just wow. made me feel like it was okay to dream like I dreamt and to vision like I visioned. They, they enabled me to, to do that. They gave me yeah. permission, Well, you know. And yeah. doesn't it play a big... Yeah. It, does, it plays a big part in who you are. I didn't go back to St Catharines from 63 until three years ago okay so that is a long time because i thought they'd forgotten about me i never heard another thing yep. and i thought maybe because i was a little wog kid and, uh, yeah, yeah, and there yeah. weren't you know at that time i was in that first batch of new australians and uh etc it's I, interesting you say that nina because mm. i've started writing at the moment as you know and i was writing about how there was a segregation and i felt like can i say it they used to call them the wogs Sure. And the Oz, which was the beach girls because yep. we were near the beach, and it was such. I kind of floated in between because my parents didn't really look like they were from Greek Greece, <laughs> so I was able to float between the both groups, and, yeah. and I was friends with everyone. But it was it was actually a real segregation, and yes. a, a not you know I'm sure there's a lot of trauma from those experiences. So you had the same. Yes, I'm um, more so yes. because my parents had very strong accents. Yeah. My surname was Yakowell. They, you know, my parents, we migrated out here. You know, they were Holocaust survivors. Mm. None of them realised, and I hadn't, what my parents mm. had gone through. The numbers tattooed on their arms. It didn't, as I was going to that school, we were just different. And I was never, ever invited to anyone's house for a birthday mm. or anything. I was what I was, but I had so much love at home and so much affirmation of myself as a person that okay I dealt with it because mm. I was okay. You share the mm. story of, in the last interview of what your father used to say to you when he called me cuckoo. Yeah yeah, well, share because, that, yeah. because from when I was born you know I just I was their first new life you know the war finished in mid 45 I was born in early 47 Mm. My mum and dad met in Auschwitz mm. and um, when I came out into the world and with all my curly hair and an optimistic attitude to them, I was their whole new life. I was their new beginning mm. and uh, but I always knew it came from the stars. I just knew it. 
I used to wave to them. I knew who they were. I didn't know what they were called, but I always found them. Mm. And I knew I was there for, for a purpose. And so everything that I took on with great optimism, mm. I would just get excited about it. And what my father would go, cuckoo. She goes, she's cuckoo. Yeah. I can all still see his little finger going, going around. Or I'd go, but what about this and this, Dad? And he'd go, big deal. <laughs> Always, that was always the case. So he never got me, mm. but they loved me. And my mum, more than anything, you know, maybe neither of them really got me, but she always made sure that I had art, my art things there, that I could do whatever, because no one in my family is an artist except for myself. Mm. And so they just gave me what I needed and sent me to a really good school because to, for Jewish people anywhere in the world, education of their children is of absolute paramount importance okay they'd go without for their kids to have the best education well they sent me to the school i don't think they realized that how difficult it would be and how it was set in the old english ways you mm. know i remember mm, you would <laughs> <laughs> just actually walking in today and seeing all the girls in the beautiful uniforms and the red jackets yeah. I was so impressed, you know, how they're still so elegant and well, they do. young ladies. And their hats. You know? yeah. I've got a little, little photo when I'm five years old okay. sitting on a suitcase there at the school yeah, yeah. with a little hat like of the, it would have been in 52, 53, Incredible. sitting on my suitcase. But we used to have the horrible maroon uniforms with pleats down the front. <laughs> I don't know if you did, but oh my goodness. And when my no, boots, I saw our uniform today, yeah. actually. No, it wasn't maroon. No, yeah. my out from maroon with the three pleats. And because I was, was, full on. <laughs> I was fairly buxom yeah, yeah, yeah. very early in yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And so as my boobs grew, the, the uniform pleats. kept lifting up. <laughs> and so it was longer at the back than it was at the front. And uh, Anyway, that's another story. So when we last talked, you were going through chemotherapy or, or just was it were you just finished then or Ooh. it was last year I think you were just coming out of it from my memory yeah. but you were still yeah you would have finished chemotherapy I didn't have hair still yeah we still didn't have hair yeah. when I interviewed you yeah tell us about the journey from there because you've been doing some really inspirational you know yeah. projects at the moment. yeah wow you know when you go through something like this and you have so many hours to speak, uh, to to ponder and to wonder why, and um, because I totally surrendered, I decided you know I wasn't going to fight this. When people sort of say, "Oh, they fought to the end," and fighting is such a hard thing on our bodies because mm. you either win or you lose. I didn't see it that way. I just did trust and surrender and just allowed it to happen. But I questioned it. Why did this happen? And I realised then that it was through going my, through the book, writing that story, my mum and dad's story, mm. with them talking, because it's their voices. Mm. I didn't write it for them. They actually spoke it and I transcribed it and, um, and put it into those words. And so hearing them and learning about their story was massive. Mm. And getting met and finding out about my relatives, because I didn't, everyone, they all died as a number. All my mum's family, my dad's only for two uncles, and um, my grandfather, the, the rest had been exterminated. So we had nothing. I felt a responsibility for my family to know about who they were mm. and the fact that my my relatives who had died as a number had their name back that i could put it in that book and i could honor them and that journey of trauma that they went through so writing that book took three and a half years which took me to the point where i ended up finding out that i had this a stage four lymphoma this blood cancer ironically it's the blood that connects us to our family it's, you know, the bloodlines, etc. So I started questioning and looking into it. And I thought, you know, it's, this is what intergenerational trauma is about. And I found out medically that not only our Aboriginal people, but the children and families of Holocaust survivors all have intergenerational trauma. 
and it's because when huge amounts of people are wiped out mm. and taken and that's the medical part but then I realized that I think just about everybody carries some trauma in them mm. and I started finding out that when a girl baby is born she's already got every egg in her ovaries that she will need to reproduce every egg is a cell and every cell has a memory mm. and that cell when it becomes a person has a memory of the grandmother the great-grandmother the grandfather and it goes back and where the trauma was from way back then it carries into the cell into that child mm. Now, if that child like me had a great childhood, which I did, my parents gave us every opportunity, they loved us unconditionally, even though they called me cuckoo and didn't get me, there was never a loved, time yeah. that they knocked back their love. If I went up to them, there'd always be a hug and a kiss. It took a second. It was never like, I'm too busy, which a lot of people do now. Mm. And so I sort of thought, okay, you know, I didn't have trauma in my childhood. So this must have been carried down generations through going yep. through that book over and over again and the generations passed. And then I thought, what about just about everyone because of wars would be carrying some trauma within them. Mm. From the men who came back from the First World War, they saw their best mates being blown up, they, they killed, they saw the worst things. They come home, there was no counselling or anything like that. They'd go back into their houses, their wives, their children, they wouldn't talk about it. Mm. They shut down and they'd go into depression and they'd get angry drinking and, and they'd yeah. start drinking mm. and they'd start abusing and then it all started. Those children and that woman, they would be carrying the angst, walking on eggshells, and that trauma. They carried it through into their adult lives and they carried it into their children mm. because that's what they learned from their families and it went on from there. Thought, and then I, COVID came, mm -hmm. the big word. Mm. It came along just when I was in my healing, like, you know, going yes. through it. And all of a sudden people were shut down. I was already in isolation. Isolation, yeah. But everyone was put into that position. All of a sudden, they couldn't go to the pubs, they couldn't go to their sporting things, to their gym, to their friends, to mm. their all the things that distract us mm. from what's really happened inside, from our childhood, from those memories, from all that. It was in your face because they couldn't get away from it. And that started creating a lot of issues and I started realising how many children, and particularly in this day that we live in now, how many children haven't had that love and that, that acknowledgement and that affirmation. And in my mind, I started seeing like this merry-go-round going round and round and a little child sitting on the back of the horse and every time it comes around, it wants waves at its mother or father and says, look at me, look at me. Affirm me, look, I'm here each time, back around. Hello, here I am. What do the parents do now? They're usually looking at their mm. machine, their, their phones, they've turned their backs, they're just, oh, look, that'll keep them occupied for a few minutes. Mm. Same thing at home, they have to work, life is so tough. They come home, they're tired, they get up early, they've got to grab those kids early, they've got to make them eat quickly, take them to before school care. Go to work, work all day, pick them up from after school care, go home, cook a meal, bath them and go to bed. Where do they have the time or the energy or the inclination to speak to those kids? Mm. And all the kids want to do is to be loved and affirmed. Mm. So those children, they put up a barrier. That's what they know, that's what they've found. And that the effect will have later on them. Mm. So I really thought about this so much how talking with adults and story, being a storyteller, how does this affect us? And how often do we talk about our childhood? You know, how Good do we question, address? Because yeah. once you can address where it comes from, our illnesses, all our illnesses, look how many illnesses people have got. Mm. 
And we live in the time, you know, have another pill, have another pill, take this, take that, drug yourself out, alcohol, more alcohol, anything to numb the pain of not being able to deal with life. Suppress it. Mm. That's it. And when you suppress it, it becomes an illness. It eats away at you like the cancer. Mm. It eats away at you Mm. and you become so ill. It's almost a business to be ill nowadays because it feeds so many people. Yeah. Let's keep the old people alive. Let's keep everyone alive because everybody's feeding off it. Mm. So I decided then that I was going to um, try and somehow, I don't know, address it. I mm-hmm. came through this. And, and um, when did that come to you? Was okay. it? Okay. Yeah. I remember that moment. Yes. I was asked to go to Dangar Island, a little island okay. in the middle of the Hawkesbury River to tell a story as a storyteller at the end of a day Mm. of a women it was a a women's um uh healing day and there were about 25 women and there were different healing modalities going on and they asked me to finish it off with a story and i didn't know but my little shambhala stone i've got this stone that the chief gave me in fiji years ago and it talks to me and this stone is a very very amazing stone and I don't do much with it sits in my room but talks to me when I need to take it so for some reason that morning I said take me with you and I did and I sat with these women at the end of the day and I told them the story of of Shambhala the stone the rock this rock and how old and ancient it was and with that I started talking about my own journey and my health and my book and about trauma and I just said and I honestly hadn't even thought about what I was going to say just came through me and I said if you did not have the love and affirmation and encouragement and hugs that I had as a child as I told them Mm. if you didn't have that don't blame your parent because They are just doing what they got from their parent and they got from their parent. Forgive them and look at your own light that shines inside of you Mm. because your spirit, that who you are, is a spark from the Godhead, from the Creator. It is not related to your family. Your body is, your DNA, your genetics, but your spirit is your own and your spirit can shine. And forgive those people, forgive your mother, your father, and acknowledge how beautiful you are. Mm. And you don't need somebody else to affirm you. Well, I finished it's a it. Big statement. I didn't realize yeah. how important it mm. was. Uh, when I finished, three women came up to me and they'd been crying. And they would have been women in their 50s. Mm. And they thanked me for saying what I had said. It's almost like a But one particular woman said to me, I'm 55 years old. I've spent all my life trying to please my mother. I have done everything for her. She has never thanked me. She's never told me she loved me. She's never done anything that has affirmed for me that I'm good in her life. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I keep trying and I keep doing it and I keep being let down. But what you've just said has just released me yeah. of that that like, for her. Mm. And I remember leaving there going, wow, that was powerful. This is telling me now that I'm going to start these women's story journeys where I will collect f- seven women tops and we will sit in circle in a sacred space, in a protected space where we will do deep listening and we will talk about our childhood stories mm. and those childhood memories that are changes that, that were impacted on our lives, something that we remember. Now, look, it didn't matter if it was a happy, joyful, whatever it was. I wasn't putting it, just bring up your trauma. I left it quite open. And then I got the first lot of women. And it's interesting because it just needed one woman to go into a darker place or a hard place And the the next one who was time to talk said, I was going to talk about something totally differently, but I've just remembered something and then they would start. Mm -hmm. And there'd be tears and they'd be remembering. 
And I was really, I felt very honoured that they would share that and they trusted me mm. and trusted that circle. And I realised that was the first one and then I thought, we need to do something after. So I thought, I know what, I'll get some rocks from the beach and I've got my Posca pens and I know how powerful to alchemise your feelings because that's how I got through a lot of my illness, mm. through my art. I said, I'll put the pens out the rocks, we'll have some food on the table, fruit and nuts and stuff, and we'll just start doing our thing. And so we sat around after the next one and the next one, and we did this, and they were really amazing. And then I went to the next level. So this was quite a, about a month and a half ago, I went to collect some rocks for another story session I was doing, I was going to do, and the rock talked to me. And it was sort of like the way Shambhala did. Now, I don't listen, to, I don't hear sounds in my head. I don't hear voices. But I swear this rock said to me, do you know how many thousands of years I've been on this earth? Do you know how many oceans I've been at the bottom? Do you know how many cliffs I've been smashed up against? How many beaches I've laid on? And you're holding me in your hand. And I looked at that rock and I went, oh my God, this rock is conscious. This rock has lived this incredible life. And I said, and I'm on this earth, and our earth is a rock. And she's conscious, and she's beautiful. And no matter what humankind is doing to destroy her, she comes back and she forgives. She forgives. She forgives. And I think, I thought, oh, that takes, takes it to the next level. So I went back to Dangar Island where I'd, did that very first one that, that yep. was the spark. And I had I decided to do two workshops. I stayed there for four nights. And the first one, six women came, and the second one, seven. And I used music. Mm. I, I got this message, music. I blindfolded them. Mm. I took them for my, I, I said, we're gonna have a journey after we, we tell the stories. So I called it from a rock to a hard place because they go to that hard place. First thing they do is connect with a rock. They took that rock in with them as they're sharing their stories. They're fondling the rock, they're holding the rock. It means it's taking them on, it's taking the energy on. Mm. When we finish those stories, and then later I got the message, when they start, if they start crying, instead of giving them a tissue, tell them to cry into the rock. Mm. Put your tears into that rock because that rock will be an analogy of you being a rock and you could get through anything. And so after lunch, we sat down, blindfolded. I took them on a journey from the left brain, which is the critical, judgmental, analytical mm -hmm. side of our brain, which, you know, we criticise not only others, and there's so much of it around right now, and judge others, but we criticise and judge ourselves. We're not good enough, we're not clever enough, we're not artistic enough, all of that. And from there, I thought, okay, music. I picked five pieces of music, 30, 40 seconds each, from a classical to a rock, which it had to be, to a uh, Latin American, or uh, whatever. I picked five different types. A pencil, a little piece of paper that big, never give anyone more than that because it's very confronting mm. given a big piece of paper. Just that, with their blindfold on, I just said, go with the music. First thing, what colour comes to your mind when you first hear it? I played them all to them first, and then I said, okay, just start doodling. Just like when you're sitting on a phone, talking to someone, if you've got a pen and paper, you just do doodling. You never think to yourself, oh, that's a bad doodle, that's a good doodle, I shouldn't have done that. You don't even think about it. That's where I wanted to take Come them. Come in that place. The play place, mm. the creative space, the space, that, that artistic moment, that moment where you are in another world. It's like a meditation. Mm. And after they did that, took the blindfold off, I got them to pick three colours of the Poscas, and they went back, played the music again, and with the colour went over it. What they could see? And then I asked them to select one of them, a piece of one of them, whatever they wanted, and put that onto the rock. 
and then we spent the rest of the afternoon. They were laughing, they were so light, and they painted those rocks, and they looked amazing. And those rocks were there, their talisman, their place to Reminder. go to, yeah. to carry with them. Whenever things get tough, pick up that rock, because that rock is you, and remind yourself who you are. So that's how I got to this. Mm. <laughs> it's pretty Such amazing, isn't it? an inspiration. What is spirit to you? Oh, spirit is um, essence, mm -hmm. the essence of who I am. And as I said before, our spirit, and I think when I was going through my healing journey and this Aboriginal woman actually did a healing of my spirit, she wanted, she did a healing on me. And she said, this is not your physical body, this is not emotional, nothing. This is, we're talking directly to your spirit. And I remember she said to me, you know, you're four months old, where are you? And all of a sudden, I thought, my goodness me. I'm in Athens, I'm in Greece, that's where I was born. There were two people there, my mum and my dad. There's something going on there. Mm. And then I remembered, I was in utero when my mum was going through her trauma from the camps, her trauma of not having anyone there in this strange foreign land with this strange language and no support except my dad. And I realised then that spirit, this was healing of my spirit and it talked to me. Then when I was going through my healing, one day I was getting carried away with a friend in between chemo sessions where you're feeling a bit stronger and my spirit was on fire because I've got a formidable spirit. It can do anything mm -hmm. and it has sure done do. just about yes. anything yes. that I've taken on. It's just worked. And, um, and, my, and I'm going off and... I heard it. My physical body cut in and said, stop now, go and lie down, you're meant to be healing. And I remember thinking, oh my God, there was a separation. My physical body's talking to my spirit, yeah. saying settle down. And I said to my friend, I'm going, I've got to go and lie down. I didn't say my physical body's telling my spirit <laughs> to, but I'm going to lie down. You could down. see the separation. And then I had this dream where I had died in an accident um, from 10 years ago and I was lying there dead in the car and I remember standing there thinking oh my god I'm dead and then I thought oh that wasn't too bad at all because I was still there mm. that's what I believe our spirit lives on our spirit is the essence of who we are it's not related to anyone our mother father children nothing it's our own. It's so powerful. Part of the spark of the God. That's how I see it. Stars. Yep. Mm. We are. Well, that takes me then to love. Mm. It's a big word. We were talking about it in the car today. How mm. would you describe the essence of love or the word love? Okay. Yeah. I think what comes in my mind straight away is uh, acceptance. Mm truth yep. and when you accept somebody and you're in your truth something moves inside you if you don't let your left brain come in and question mm. it we are made of love our spirit is love God is love the creator is love we just have to look around us at the beauty and we go oh my god how, how amazing is this is this world that we're in why is humanity stuffing it up so much mm. it's the total opposite so that to me is love pure love and and um empathy feeling but not f not feeling it where you take it on because you've got empaths there yeah. who they feel and they take on that pain. I don't take on anyone else's pain. Yeah. I've you know, I've got my own, I've got boundaries, but I'll speak my truth and I genuinely love and you know to love and be loved in return, you know. And uh, and love has so many levels and layers to it. Yeah. So I guess that's as close as I can come to. Yeah, yeah. With all that's going on at the moment in the world mm. I mean you've lived through a lot you're witnessing what's happening at the moment yeah. what gives you hope 
for humanity? Do you know what? I can see that there's a shift going on. Okay. And I know that there's a dark side of everything. There's the yin and the yang and the positive and the negative and the black and the white. I honestly believe that we've had to go to some low points in our lives and to get what I call a cosmic kick in the backside and we have a choice yeah. whether we swim or we sink. Whether we will go along with this and we will learn from what's thrown at us and that if we live in love and we know that we're okay and we know that we have a light shining in us that we can deal with it. I feel very blessed because I am meeting and I have met so many amazing young people, Saf, like you mm. and others, young, amazing people who are seeing, who are doing something, not to allow that darkness to enfold you, don't allow that negativity to take over break through it if you feel a bit down just go lie down and mm. go and look at a flower go and walk in the bush go and touch a tree go and sit at the ocean grab a rock do all those little it's things smart. Yep. that's it mm. remember you know this is this is really the truth this is such an amazing earth and i think we had to come to this point before we come out of it but i believe that we will and i believe that our young people are seeing through all of it mm. there are those who won't but everyone has their own journey their mm. own life and not to judge others it's feel sorry for them and think that's their trauma it mm. goes back to trauma completely if something if somebody is really horrid and they're doing horrible things and you know they are so injured inside that they just don't know how to deal with it mm. it goes back to trauma mm. And when you said you had the healing recently, what connected you to the Aboriginal community? Because you seem to have a very big connection with the community. Yes, this particular woman, she was living on Dangar Island okay. and um, I'd met her before and uh, when I went to stay there because somebody had gifted me a few nights there when I was really not well mm. and uh, they said to me, you know, if you'd like, you know, this woman, she would give you a healing and I had a lot of people who were offering me healing and I'm thinking what sort of modality is this and when she said it was a healing of the spirit I went along I had met her but I've worked in um, just about every Aboriginal community in New South Wales That's over right. something like 35 years as a community artist yes as a storyteller on fabric collect I and wanted festivals. to share that with the listeners <laughs> yeah because I worked with fabric and I called it the fabric of our lives mm -hmm. and it's what brings us all the weaving of all our stories. And so because I broke up, I, I developed a whole lot of new ways of working with fabric printing. Um, I tested a lot. I was fortunate to have our sponsors that made the paints. And that's, that, right. that's a story in itself and it's all in my book, Don't, the Don't Cry Dance, yes. all of that, my journey. Um, that is what sort of has taken me out and work when you work with stories and I go into some classrooms and there are all these angry Aboriginal kids and I could see them staring at me like you know, another white woman coming in mm -hmm. to you know with their anger their racism trauma. in yeah. their trauma absolute yeah. trauma and you know the first thing I do is I open up my heart and I would tell them my story Mm. Tell them about my parents. I would tell them such horrific stuff that they would just like that. Mm. And I'd say, well, you know, we're all, we're all, the, we're same. all yeah, the same. There's a saying that I love and it's um, the only difference between two people is their story. And it doesn't matter where we're from, who we are, our story is what's different. So when we can... I, I found it challenging going into those communities and breaking down those barriers. You know, I'm just... But uh, you did it. I did. It always worked. What was your one of your fondest moments or places that you got to work in? Wow. God. I mean, so many, 35 years. Absolutely. <laughs> Festivals. Yeah, what's first thing that I comes think, to your right brain? <laughs> I, think, yeah. I think breaking in, you know, when I was just talking, going into a, a school in an Aboriginal community where there's so much anger, so much alcohol, so much drugs and these young people who don't really want to be there mm -hmm. but who just happened to have just 
been studying about the Holocaust, I remember, because the teacher told me later. Okay. And here I walked in with the story, Amy, yeah. and when I told them, my mother's role in the camp was to take the bodies, the dead bodies, out of the barracks and put them in the crematoriums, how my family were killed in the gas chambers. When you start coming in with those, because mm. they, their trauma is so deeply embedded, so I had to come in with my own... Empathy, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And then just to see their faces change, something shifted in them, mm. and then we could start creating mm, there's an understanding absolutely then I wasn't this white woman who's coming to tell them I was just one of them collecting their stories mm. teaching them a new skill where they printed on their shirts mm. where they had something and they could say whatever they wanted I said as long as you you don't swear in it and you don't you know you don't put people in judge and you know whatever good else. intention absolutely yep. I suppose yeah, they would. Gee, it's hard. I think in the Fiji communities. Cause yes, I did, you did a lot in Fiji communities. Yes, and yep. I think some funny little things because I'd go in and they wouldn't have any opportunities there at all. Yeah. You know, our Aboriginal communities, no matter what, there was money thrown at them from the government. Okay. In the Fiji Islands, there's nothing. You know, there's no dole or unemployment or anything like that. You mm. know? If you, you did not know that. Yeah. No, I know. You walk in there, you, you walk in there and uh, so I'd go in there with all my magic. So I had this paint that glows in the dark mm. and I'd be in the village and I'd start doing stars because I always came. I told them, they'd say, where are you from? I'd say, I'm from the stars. <laughs> they called me Kalo Kalo, which means some stars. And that was my name. Yeah. Everyone knew me over there as Kalo Kalo. And so I, because it was easy for me to cut out star stencils and they'd, Start would start printing and they were just agog at the colours and the, the printing of these stars. And I remember these big Fijian women because they're all fairly big. And I remember they were sending their kids back to their bores to bring out every T-shirt or anything they could find to throw on the table so they could print on printing, it as well. Yeah. And I remember this one woman, this child brings this T-shirt and it's about that big and she was about that big. Mm -mm -mm. And we put the T-shirt down on the table and I was just about to print it and I noticed up in the corner it had written Itty Bitty Titty Committee and I just cracked <laughs> up on the spot. It just seemed itty so... Bitty. It was the biggest T-shirt, <laughs> the biggest woman mm. and it was the Itty Bitty Titty Committee <laughs> and I can never forget that. Yeah. I've got it in my bathroom at home. I've got it up on the wall because oh, it always... Oh, screen print. Yeah. yeah, it always cracks me up. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a... You know, there's so many stories but, you know, there were a couple of how you win them over. One of the connections between us is we're both mothers of twins, girl boy twins. Yeah. And why I'm bringing that up is I get the comment a lot, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. So listening to your, and I have two other children, you know, and listening to your story, well, we were both single mothers as yeah. well when I had my twins. So how do you do it? I was listening to a lady talk about that today and she was saying that, well, I, I, I do it, but I drop a, you know, there's a lot that I didn't do, you know, so that we have to forgive within ourselves. She's like, yeah. if I'm at someone's, you know, if I'm at this exhibition or, or working with, in Fiji, then I've dropped something at school with my son or, you know, there's always something being missed. Yeah. How would you, you know, answer that statement? Look, how, how do you, how did you do it? Look, <laughs> how did I do it? Yeah. And with the mind I had, yeah. you thought that I couldn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And I did. I took on huge things, even as a single mum of twins. And they were 10 months old and their father was never there for them. Never a cent, never saw them, never rang them, never said happy birthday, never nothing. And so it's been like anything else, I just sort of, I guess I trusted and surrendered. I was frustrated so many times. Mm. But you know what? I did the best I could, and that's what we do. We, we do. do the best we can. <laughs> we get exhausted. We get all those things. Mm. You know, you just... and you, you, I've had two house fires. I've had two houses yes, burned down that's as in the book. well. Yeah, yeah, two houses <laughs> burned down. So I've lost everything. And the f first house was because my son put some oil on the one house that I managed to get for us with everything That's an in incredible her. story. And he put on yeah. some oil to make chips and then went in his room and fell asleep. 
and we lost everything. Too. I have a son that loves lighting at the moment. I'm trying to explain See? to him how dangerous yeah. it is and he grabs a lighter. Well, you yeah. know, I remember that in our street when they were young yeah. and I remember the kids were getting into a bit fiery about yeah. the place and I went down and got the police one day and I said, right, can you come up to my place? I think these kids need a big shock. And all the kids in the street were hanging around. They'd all been lighting little fires mm. and the police turned up and they made sure I said, have your hat, make sure you <laughs> it really... stand. And I got the kids in and their ones outside were looking in. I'm saying, you can get in here too. <laughs> and I, sat, I said, you want to know what's going on? And I sat them all on the floor yeah. so that the police looked even much bigger. Mm. And then he told them, you know, and, and so I hope I frightened them. <laughs> so I would take sort of dramatic action. Yeah. Um, but I guess I, I apologised to my kids on many occasions and said, look, whatever. I loved you and they knew that. I loved you unconditionally. Mm. They thanked me for taking them up to Terrigal where we could live and they had the beach and they had their freedom and they were very grateful to me. Mm. And now they're 48 and they're still living with me. <laughs> they came back. Well, my son, he'll always look after me. So I've just always just loved them. Mm. And I've said, okay, I'm not perfect. I did what I could. I thought it was right at the time. But... You know, I stuffed up like we all do. Yeah. I just, all I can do is love you. And even now I see things so clearly and I see the ridiculousness of things that they say or do. And I think, back off, Nina. Just love them. Mm. Because you can never tell your kids. Others will come to me and ask me mm. for advice. But with your kids, it's a different It's a different thing. story. So you've still got a way to go to be... 48 and they're still there with still me got, I have one 19 year old but yeah the twins yeah. are only 9 Yeah, <laughs> or 8 but actually you know, not even 9 just do <laughs> yeah. just love them I yeah. reckon that just love them affirm them and have boundaries mm. you know I mean you just got to have boundaries like my room that's it You're mm. not, that is my space <laughs> Do not come in mm. so sometimes I know about mothers who their kids all sleep in their beds and they're like You've got to have one sacred, sacred space place. of your own. Yeah, or sacred space. It I mean, I do. do my mindfulness practice or meditation yeah. and I'm. All, they're very, you know, they know, Good do not you. come near mum when she's got the eyes closed yeah. and she's in that zone. You do not yeah. come near me. If your door's <laughs> closed and you're yeah. in there. And if my door's closed, do not come in my bedroom. That's it. <laughs> that's where very and, clear. And yeah. when I had my studio up the back of our house, yeah. so well, that is, is my this space. This is my my space here yes see? yeah <laughs> and I'd, that's it yeah you've got to get permission to come in here yeah, this yeah. Is, you've got the rest of the house yeah and everything else so yeah that's yeah, it hasn't been easy but i think love won through in the end yes and they'd really love me and you know they they helped me when i was going through my that worst time in my life and they were there they fed me they looked after me they cared for it was me a diff- very difficult, they really yeah. did and they thought they were going to lose me and mm. that was the biggest freak out for them. Mm. I never thought for a minute that they would, but they did. So did everyone else. Thought I was going. I like, didn't. I had faith. You were pulling. I did couldn't. see it. Yeah. yeah I really saw it. Others yeah. were really concerned. You know how, mm. how I was, but I never thought for a minute. No. You know. Anyway, just love. Go yes. back to love. This question, I, I sometimes I feel like. If you, you know, what do you feel your legacy will be when you do, mm, you know, the physical go. form does yeah. go. And it will. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm quite at ease with that, you know. I figured yeah. I meant to be here right now because I would have gone otherwise and I've never been Definitely afraid of Definitely to be dying. here right now. <laughs> yeah. I've never been fearful of death or anything like that. I have full faith and trust. And um, I guess Incredible. I hope my legacy would be to inspire people to believe that they can be greater than they think they can, mm. that they can achieve more than they think they can, not to judge themselves, not to judge others, not to criticise, and to just stop before you react, stop before you, you speak, think about it, and speak sweet words. Don't, don't lose it with people because of your frustration. And also that creativity and ex- expression through the arts through music through dance through whatever mm. is of vital importance because if you cannot express yourself you lose your stagnant. story you lose yourself or lose your story yeah. you lose your story you lose yourself mm. and you sit there and go i'm bored 
Oh my God, if anyone ever said, my kids ever said they were bored, I'd say, only boring people get bored and then they go, I'm not boring. Well, if you just sit under a tree and look at the leaves and think about life and dream and have a sleep or look at the clouds, look at the clouds. one of my favourite things when exactly. I was Sienna's age. Yeah. You know, what's this bored business? Yeah. What, do you want me to do a dance and entertain you? I'm lucky my children... Oh, they very often don't get bored. But they they've had, but they've yeah, had they everything. Create, you've yeah. you've made sure that they had yeah. everything that they needed to create and yeah. do, and that's that's the best thing you can do. Mm. And I guess for me, and my kids wanting to still be with me, you think, well, I must have done something. Other families or kids can't wait to get away. You know, take off, run away. I don't think they ever ran away. Maybe Adam ran once, but <laughs> he came back pretty quickly. Mm. I think the last thing I'm questioning a lot at the moment, like, do you believe when we come in to this experience that we have a purpose? Oh, totally. Right. I believe we sign a contract and we have a mission and we sign up for it before we come down and uh, it, most definitely. Mm. And um, I think it's sad when we don't fulfil it because we don't believe in ourselves and again it goes back to trauma. And lack of love. Exactly. Trauma and lack of love. Not believing in yourself because no one else believed in you. We always remember a teacher at school that really believed in you, even though the others all treated you. Had that moment today. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You see, you if know, it wasn't for those teachers, that's yeah. it. You know, you remember that. No, I think um, trauma and love to me. And so, if you could define your purpose. Or your well, mission, yeah. Yeah, I think my mission is to leave the story about how important stories yeah. are and that we share those stories in every form that we can mm. and that we're not fear. I'd like people to not go around being scared mm. and you being scared of what? And using that word busy, busy, I'm so busy, so busy, everyone's busy, busy, and I find that busy, I can't use that word, and people say, oh, Nina, we know you're so busy, and I go, no, I am never busy, I am fully engaged in my life, that is what I do, that means that I am in control of my life, and if you ask me for, to do something, and it, I, I will do it, I'll it respond. resonates, and yep. that's right, I will never be too busy, to go and do something that I'm called to do, which which works with my heart. And it comes, you know, busy as if you work in a bread shop or, <laughs> you know, or coals and, you know, busy hour, you know, that sort of thing. It's busy. Mm. So I, just... I love finishing on that note. <laughs> <laughs> so be fully engaged in life. Fully engaged in life. Yeah, that's me. Live purposefully. Absolutely. Mm. And know that we're on a mission. And don't be afraid. You know, when you time you sign the you sign it. We sign when we come down. Some leave earlier than others. Some around a lot longer. Mm. Whatever it throws at you, go mm. with it. Thank Gratitude. you so much. Oh, Steph. <laughs> Steph. <laughs> Steph. It is my pleasure. Thank you. It's really good for me to be able to go around in my head and share get stories. Asked, yes, and and be asked such intelligent questions. Mm. So. <laughs> Thank you. I feel I've found my purpose. <laughs> you have. You're good at it too. Thank you so much for being on the One Space Love Show. <laughs> my pleasure. Our space. Our space. Our space. Our space. Our space. Our space.